it's our intention that EDSAC will be an educational resource so that when school parties visit the National Museum of Computing, like these here today, we can show them how EDSAC worked, how it has all the same parts as a modern computer, and we can show them how many of the early ideas in programming, like the subroutine library, were invented by EDSAC and allowed people at Cambridge University to tackle demanding problems with EDSAC, the Digital Automatic Sequence Calculator. We're now starting the commissioning phase of EDSAC. Our volunteers have been designing and building chassis containing circuits at their homes. They're now bringing them here to fit them in the racks that have been erected and now have power supplies connected. And so we can begin seeing if the chassis plug together and turn into a working EDSAC. Let me show you around, starting here in the front row. These are all chassis that have been built by volunteers and put in the machine. These two racks are concerned with how the machine accesses its memory. EDSAC's original memory was mercury delay lines. For the replica, we're using nickel delay lines. What these circuits have to do is generate the signals of pulses that travel through those delay lines, receive them back, regenerate them, and turn them into nice sharp digits that can be used by the rest of the computer. And so we have a chassis 01 for every one of the delay lines. And then in the middle, we have a different type of chassis, which is concerned with decoding addresses. So when the computer says, I want to read word 100 of its store, then these circuits will select which tank and therefore which of these regenerators is exercised to either read or write that data. If we move into the machine, the third rack in the front row here is really the beating heart of the machine. At the very bottom, we have what is called the clock pulse generator, and indeed that was the first chassis to be designed. Um, that has the central clock which drives the rest of the machine. Then coming up, this set of five racks are called digit pulse generators and they're concerned with deciding where the first bit, second bit, third bit and so forth are as that clock ticks driving the machine. And that's used by other parts of the computer, for example, to break an instruction or order into its component parts to know when it's starting an arithmetic operation and so forth. So this part is quite critical. We will be building more chassis that come in here, which are amplifiers to send these pulses all the way around the rest of the machine. This fourth rack in the front row is currently empty, but actually is one of the most important in the machine. It will contain the chassis concerned with input and output. Those will probably be one of the last parts of the machine that we actually connect up although we do have a working teleprinter and we do have a working tape reader currently connected to a modern Raspberry Pi so we can test it. And so here will also be and the circuits that work the operator's desk. The operator's desk will stand in front of the machine and have the tape reader and the teleprinter and the few buttons needed to control the machine. And on the other side of the room will be the bank of oscilloscopes that let you see the contents of memory and the working memories of the machine. John and Nigel here are working on the middle row of racks. The middle row of the machine is concerned with what was called main control. That's the part of the computer that decodes each instruction as it's fetched from memory and decides which other parts of the machine, in particular the arithmetic unit that we'll come to in the back row, um, and the store system to fetch the data that's going to be worked on and put it back. So again, this is a very critical part of the machine. Um, it's what we would call the central processor in a modern computer. Most of this is being worked on by another volunteer, James Barr, um, who's still fairly early in the design phase. But John has been working on the addressing part of the system. And the unit he and Nigel are putting in is called a tank flashing unit. Let's come round now to the back row of the machine. Here we have five racks. The two at the very end are actually identical to the two we saw at the left-hand end of the front row and are again concerned with driving the memory of the machine, regenerating the pulses going through the delay lines. And when the machine is complete, behind us will be another coffin full of the tanks for the main store. These three empty racks are being worked on um, by Nigel Benet, 
who's building the arithmetic unit. That's the part of the machine that knows how to do addition, subtraction and multiply. There was no divide in EDSAC, you had to program it yourself, but you can do that using multiplication and subtraction. Um, this is quite a complex part of the machine. Um, we're fortunate that there's a reasonably good textual description of it. Um, Nigel has quite a lot of it working at his home already, including the adding circuits and the shifting circuits, which are at the heart of doing arithmetic on a digital computer. Stepping out of the 1940s into the year 2014, this is our power supply system for EDSAC. The original machine was powered by what was called a motor generator, essentially an electric motor driving a generator to produce a stable voltage for the EDSAC machine. Back in the 1940s, the municipal power supplies in Cambridge were not very, re very reliable and very stable. We've chosen not to replicate that, partly because we have no information about it, but also to meet modern expectations about electrical safety and to be efficient in our use of electricity. We've built a custom supply. One of our volunteers, Alex Passmore, designed this. At the very bottom are modern power supply units that take in mains and generate the high tension direct current that EDSAC needs. And then um, above that are various meters that allow us to monitor what the power supply is producing, what current the machine is taking, and importantly, lots of protection in case there should be an electrical accident. Um, we've arranged that if there's a short circuit in the machine, the power supply switches off very quickly. When you turn it on, it sounds a klaxon, so if anyone's working inside the machine, they're aware. And if we have any kind of significant variation in the power the machine is taken, again, the, the unit switches it off. Another thing the unit has to do is be careful about the sequence in which we put power into the machine. Valves have things called heaters in them. We turn those on first of all. We let the heaters run for a minute or two to get hot. Um, that turns the valves into their emissive state. They need to be in when they're working. And then the box automatically brings up the high tension and again does that in two stages so that we're not subjecting the machine to wild swings in voltage and we're only applying the high voltages when the machine is warm. There's also a big red emergency off button and indeed there are buttons all around the machine area so if there's a problem while we're working on it we can instantly isolate it. Finsters the Museum will come down this corridor and through these windows they will be able to see into the back of the machine and on the floor will be one of the large wooden coffins containing the memory. Today we're using this as a workspace area as we're commissioning the machine and again that's of interest to visitors. They can see our volunteers working in the room and the equipment they're using. As a visitor comes in from the corridor, the first thing they will see in the large systems gallery is EDSAC, a view of the side of the machine and all its racks and chassis. As they walk through, they'll be able to see the operator's desk. And then once they've looked at EDSAC, in the rest of the gallery, they can see which the Harwell Decatron computer.